and and uh, and as we waited for him to put away his stuff and get ready, he finally did that, and he told us to get in the car. So we all got in the car, um, and uh, we hurriedly drove into Gallup, <laughs> and. Uh, I, you know, was he going to be staying this mad for all this time and uh, about an hour had already transpired since that had happened and we, nobody was saying a word or anything and we're still in suspense of what, how long his anger was going to go through. And we got to Gallup and uh, in, instead of getting mad or doing anything, he actually went and took us to the theater and took us inside to a, a movie and we watched a whole movie for about another hour or so and then he took us out to dinner and after dinner he took us to buy some ice cream and just uh, the whole reverse of what our expectation of whether his anger was going to carry out through all the evening or throughout <laughs> was just not. Uh, it was his way of just calming himself down and, uh, and uh, um, you know, just releasing his anger and his stress out of it because I know he was in a hurry to do that and it was a special order but it broke and that's how he kind of dealt with his art and how he did things and uh, after a while when uh, he was thoroughly mellowed out we were all talking and laughing and coming back home again and, and uh, now everything was uh, set right again and uh, uh, everybody went off and got home and started taking care of some other things in the household. And he went back into his workshop and I went in with him. And when he went in, uh, it's a real a sad story in, in my own experience of or remembering him. He went back and he picked that stone up and uh, or picked up, picked up the bracelet, took a look, look at it and said, I can fix it. And that's how he fixed it. He put that brace across it. And there was an art element that he did. Uh, he also stamped a piece on there. And he, he went over that crack piece. He didn't remove it. He didn't do anything to it. But he did it. And he added that little touch on it. Similar how he did some of these pieces. So that's what I like about this piece. Because it reminds me of that other story. And his work with coral in that sense too. And so, um, you know, that's one thing that's really absent from um, a lot of the pieces that people have made. Uh, and have passed on and yet we remember stories about them and um, we actually can have a real social context to that particular piece as I'm showing here as well too. So that's what this piece reminds me of. This is another one of um, Dan Simplicio's uh, work um, that he uh, did almost in the same era as the other one in 1945 where um, he was still going through a lot of his own recovery um, after his wound from World War II, um, it showed, shows a lot of its, its um, of, of work that, and the time that was required to be sitting down and um, being able to work all the details in this one. Um, this is really reflective of that, I think, that the lack of mobility he had at that time. Another piece he did later on, he create that dance and Plesio created later on in life, where he was becoming much more mobile, and um, um, and his recovery was progressing much better, and allowed him to do um, so many different other types of uh, uh, design elements um, that required him to be moving around. Um, in a piece like this, he, there, which required, has a lot of, num uh, lot of stamp work in it and a lot of work on the turquoise itself. Um, the stamp work is a leaf design that he created and actually made the leaf himself uh, on a high-tempered uh, piece of uh, metal that he actually inscribed the, uh, uh, the leaf design on that, which eventually became his stamp um, that you see here. And in doing so, um, when making his stamps, um, it required more mobility to move around. He had his workstation set up in that way where he had a lot of his design elements in one side of the table and in the center of the table he would have his, uh, his actual um, um, tools he needed for melting the silver, the torches, um, was the main work area that he did to create the outline 
and the silver soldering that was required on each piece like this. And that was that in the middle. Then the stamping area was set to the side. It actually, from the design area of where he would set out and cut out his uh, silver patterns was on his right side. Um, he would actually move from that side all the way to the stamp side and he would stamp his pieces out requiring a lot of mobility. And I talked earlier about the fact that how physically strong he was. Um, he was very, uh, a very stocky type person where his forearms were very massive. And I kind of wondered about that. Maybe his years in walking around with a crutch as well too gave him that strength too as well too to lift himself. But he had a considerable amount of strength and uh, which was very good for his stamping um, uh, abilities as well too because once he would set his silver he would hit it so hard that it re just required one hit and move on to the next area and move on to the next area but obviously you've seen a lot of mobility in his work from moving from one station to another when he had the ability to do that 